Microbiology is awesome. Even though in the world building sphere, speculative microbiology often gets overshadowed by speculative zoology, I wanted to nevertheless do an episode on the silicon based microbes that inhabit my world of Torah. This episode will be a deviation from the astronomical world building we have done in this series thus far, but that's fine. I'm excited to tell you about what I cooked up for today, so let's dive right into these boiling sulfuric acid bowls to see what's in there. Hello everyone and welcome back to Project Espa. My name is EG Online, and in this series I document my process of world building my world Espa. Thus far in the series we have been working on Espa's star system, a wide separation trinary star system with the sun-like star Ojor at its center, being orbited by two red dwarfs at great distance. Ojor has nine planets, the fourth of which is the gas giant Manta the system's main Jovian Shepherd, over twice as massive as Jupiter. In the last few episodes we have started building Manta's sextuple moon system, and in the very last episode built the life-bearing world of Tora, with the intent of making it harbor silicon-based microbes. So that's what we will be doing today. Project Espa can step aside. Today we're doing Project Tora. So Tora has had life on it since its addition to the project in 2017, and while the scientific accuracy of the world has made leaps since, the life on it has never been that fleshed out in the first place. Exotic life remains highly speculative, and world building on a topic science has yet to fully grasp is a high challenge. For that reason I have largely avoided going too deep with the details, mostly leaving it at the fact that it was unicellular and thermophilic. Of course there was the whole thing about it living in ethanol oceans, which I already explained last video wouldn't have worked, and the bit uncreative decision to have them look just like algae, which also wouldn't work and they weren't even photosynthetic, but other than that there's not much to critique here. So the plan today is to pick up where we left off last episode. We have a world with the conditions set right for silicon based abiogenesis to occur in sulfuric acid pools inside hot volcanic caves we built. Our first goal today will be to describe in as much detail as soft realism allows the Tauran Luca, and then, using that as our single celled body plan derive at least two lineages of microbes from it. I will keep it at 2 for now, as this is my first time doing a speculative world building episode at all, so I don't want to overdo it right away. That said, let's get started. On Earth, life arose pretty early on in the planet's history, and we can with confidence say some things were alive here by 3.7 billion years ago at the latest. In geologic science, this is known as the biosignature boundary, which contrasts the habitability boundary roughly dated to 4.1 billion years ago, which is the earliest period the Earth could have sustained life. Right in between these dates is when we presume life somehow found a way. Now the Earth itself is just shy of 4.6 billion years old, which means life arose relatively early on in our planet's history. Tora is an ancient world, its age being over 5.8 billion years old gives us a large timeline to work with. Being much smaller and less massive than the Earth, Tora would cool quickly after formation and form a crust. While it would initially suffer meteor bombardments, as the resonance chain around Manta locks in, it will reach its habitability boundary very quickly, perhaps as soon as just 100 million years after its formation. So just like on Earth, life on Tora might arise quickly then maybe. Well, the apparent haste with which life arose on Earth is suspicious, but with a sample size of one we cannot rule out mere coincidence. At the very least, it seems plausible to me that silicon based abiogenesis would be harder to achieve than carbon based abiogenesis. So instead, I think it's reasonable that Tora will take more time to give rise to life than the Earth did. How much more exactly is anyone's guess really, so I'm just gonna go and say 2.12 billion years after the world's formation, life first arises. In 
In the last video we already identified a plausible metabolism for life on Torah using elemental silicon and hydrochloric acid, a reaction which can run stably in concentrated sulfuric acid at elevated temperatures. We designed the moon in such a way that it can reliably produce both sulfuric and hydrochloric acid to an isolated dry and anoxic cave environment for the microbes to utilize. Running this reaction at around 300 degrees Celsius is most optimal and produces some energy for the organism, but it's still not quite as efficient as photosynthesis or aerobic respiration would be. But it's enough to sustain a simple unicellular organism. To make sure the metabolism is running efficiently, the cell will want to isolate itself from interfering chemicals that could inhibit the reaction or otherwise destabilize it. Doing so will also help it better regulate the sulfuric acid concentration inside and protect its other organelles. In order to achieve this, it will need to form a protective casing or cell membrane around itself. Building a membrane for a silicon-based microbe living in boiling sulfuric acid will be a very different task than it would be were it carbon-based. After all, lipids and proteins would not be able to do the job here. And additionally to high acid resistance, the membrane should also be oxygen resistant and hydrophobic, as water and oxygen are so extremely toxic to the organism, it would do well blocking them as best as it can from entering the cell, even if they are already traced in its environment. Fortunately, there are some materials that could hypothetically do this. Types of fluorinated polysiloxanes are extremely hydrophobic and oxygen resistant, as well as mechanically flexible. POSS cages can be self-repairing and trap oxygen, and metal silicides are easy to create and extraordinarily strong. That said, they each have some drawbacks too. Fluorinated polysiloxanes become unstable at temperatures exceeding 200 degrees Celsius. POSS cages are difficult to assemble and metal silicides are electrically conductive, which would disrupt the cell's chemistry. So perhaps the organism evolves some sort of lucky combination of these that avoids these drawbacks, but keeps the positives to build its protective membrane. Finally, the organism will need a way to store its genetic code, allowing the cell to store important information such as how to repair damage, do metabolism and create copies of itself. Carbon-based life uses either DNA or RNA to do this, but like other carbon-based molecules, these would rapidly dissolve in the environment Tauran life inhabits. There are some plausible options to use here as well though, but they each face drawbacks. By far the most promising option to me seems to be using a titanium silicate lather with alternating pairs of titanium, silicon and oxygen. These could be stacked to build a very large molecule that allows for bases to attach to, creating a molecule that could function very similarly to RNA and store genetic information. The drawback being that this structure would require, well, oxygen to build, so its stability is very much not ensured. But since it still seems like the best option, let's say somehow the organism can make it work and is also able to replicate and repair its code in a similar way to how prokaryotes do so on Earth. Enabling the organism to replicate its genetic code means it can start making copies and reproducing itself. Usually, these will be perfect copies, but sometimes an errorous base might attach to the latter, creating a mutation in the copy. Making the self-replication process be less than 100% accurate is a good thing though, because by allowing small accidental mutations, we enable Darwinian evolution for life on Torah. And there we go, we now have a speculative design for the last Torn common ancestor. But that's such a mouthful, so let's try and give it a proper name. Typically in zoology, and also speculative zoology, creatures are named following standard Linnaean nomenclature, aka Greek and Latin names. While using those is absolutely fine, it's gotten a bit saturated, and given Torrens' life exotic nature, I think I want to derive my nomenclature from a non-Western language. Not having the standard nomenclature will reflect how truly alien these microbes are in the name. So let's instead derive these microbes' names from a long-time language of interest of mine, Georgian. 
Something about how Georgian syllables are structured I find really fitting to these exotic microbes. At least, that's how it sounds to me in my head. With the pronunciation being angelificated on purpose, let's call our last thorn common ancestor Mjava Mzaruli, or Sour Cook, after the hot acidic metabolism it would have had. Not long after Mazavam Zaruli lives, random mutations will drive it to evolve and speciate. One of the most important evolutions post Luca on Earth was the evolution of a brand new organelle called the flagellum. The flagellum is a hair-like appendage found on many microorganisms that allows the cell a small degree of motility. Being able to move around the acidic cave pool will give Mazav Mazaruli's descendants a major advantage. Now, the cell can seek out safe areas and pathfind to more nutritious spots. The appearance of motility will be followed by life on Tora evolving rudimentary phagocytosis, which is the ability to ingest food particles, allowing the cell to derive more energy from its environment than just raw metabolism. Since its silicon-based metabolism is highly limited, this will be a crucial evolution. But even if phagocytosis would evolve, it seems to me unlikely that it would then proceed all the way to evolve predation on other cells as well. On Earth, this behavior is exceedingly rare among prokaryotes, with no known lineages being fully predatory. But you could also string this argument around and say that's exactly why they should be predatory. With thorn life being less diverse, this would almost certainly mean cannibalistic behavior for these cells. It's possible these cells would engage in it under rare circumstances, but as a main feeding method, I just don't think it will happen. Let's call this new lineage of cells Modzravi Mishameli, or Moving Eater, and they will be the first descendants from Mazava Mazaruli and appear within a few dozen million years after it lived. On Earth, certain species of fungi such as Cladosporium and Cryptococcus have been found growing as black mold inside the collapsed reactor of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, where they use melanin, the same biomolecule found in our skin to absorb the radiation. The radiation ionizes the melanin by stripping away electrons from it. These free electrons can then be used by the fungi to supercharge its metabolism in a process known as radiosynthesis. On Earth, there's not that much background radiation outside of nuclear disaster zones, which tend to not be a very natural occurrence. However, on Tora we have a very consistent source of background radiation on the Moon's surface, namely the 45 sievers a day caused by Manta's magnetosphere. This presents a unique evolutionary challenge, but also an opportunity for Tauran life I want to tap into. While most Thorin caves are several hundred meters underground, over time due to geological activities, some may rise closer to the surface or even become exposed to it. This would give the microbes a shower of ionizing radiation. At this stage, some microbes might speciate to use a silicon-based melanin alternative, such as a polysilane or certain carbon-silicon compounds as a protective pigment, as both of these are stable in sulfuric acid. But as the absorbed radiation stimulates electron transport, these microbes will quickly begin to tap into it for their metabolism. Thus, radiotrophy could arise as a byproduct of radiation resistance. Let's call this ancestral radiotroph Axnebuli Basuki or excited response. A little on the nose maybe, but I like it. These microbes would proliferate in low radiation caves, but not be able to live at the surface yet. Once the ability for radiotrophy is there though, these microbes will evolve it further to maximize their radiation intake and make their metabolism as efficient as possible. One adaptation might be switching their primitive pigment to a molecule such as iron chloride. When iron chlorides absorb radiation, they break up into free iron and free chlorine. Free chlorine especially is a powerful oxidizer and could power an array of efficient metabolic reactions. Additionally, when combined with just a minute amount of water, it crystallizes into the greenish tetrahydrate. A colony of these microbes on the surface could create a crystalline film around them to insulate themselves from the cold, overexposure to radiation, and even water damage. 
as these colonies leave behind a thin crystalline tetrahydrate crust, it would also explain the teal patches on Taurus' surface as being biological in origin, which I think is incredibly neat. Let's call these crystal-making radiotrophs Sinatla Mismeli, or Light Drinker, and they will serve as our third and final lineage derived from Harluca, as well as Tora's most evolved life form, emerging maybe about a billion years after Mazav Mazaruli lived. I could quite honestly go a bit further with this still, there's a vast diversity plausible for unicellulars. But this script took me well over a month to write, and I do have other videos in the pipeline I want to produce, so I will stop here for now. But if you thought that wasn't too shabby for a first dive into speculative biology for me, let me know in the comments, and we could certainly revisit and even expand Project Tora in the future. The volcanically active world of Tora is the second moon of the gas giant Manta. Being a generally cold, irradiated tidal world with only a trace atmosphere consisting of mostly nitrogen, chlorine and some sulfur compounds. Deep beneath the surface of the world, silicon-based life has evolved, having arisen in hot 300 degrees Celsius volcanic caves, where they metabolize silicon in pools of sulfuric acid. Having evolved a robust acid-resistant membrane and a metal-based genetic code, these microbes are uniquely suited to this otherwise hostile environment. One species of microbe has learned to swim, evolving a flangellum to be able to move around in the sulfuric acid pool, finding food particles to support its otherwise slow metabolism. Another species of microbes have evolved the ability to drink ionizing radiation to charge their metabolism. Living in the more shallow caves, wet with sulfuric acid, they capture the radiation generated by Manta's magnetosphere to conduct rudimentary radiosynthesis. A process refined by a lineage of microbes using iron chlorides to hypercharge their metabolism with the abundant radiation on Tora's surface, generating a protective film of teal crystalline tetrahydrate across the surface. For explorers from ESPA, it would be very hard to find the life on Tora. The moon would be too radioactive for them to visit in person or even with probes. Since the life is only microbial, and with the exception of the surface radiotrophs all underground, it would be almost undetectable where one not searching for it. Apart from, of course, the teal patches on Torah's surface, which would prove an enduring cultural mystery to Espa. And that brings us to the comment of this episode, which is by Nathan Leach4933. It might have been interesting to explore the possibility of the intense radiation playing a role in the chemical breakdown processes you use to concentrate the necessary compounds for life. Sort of like how in our own atmosphere radiation breaks ozone into oxygen gas and a free oxygen radical. It feels like you might be able to further justify the evolution of Tora's chemical composition that way. Oh yes, definitely. But as you saw today, I already had a plan for the radiation in the teal patches. While it's cool mentioning there's a lot of radioactivity there, even cooler to me is the fact we can then use that as a world building avenue. For Idemei the radiation was a bit too high to do this, but I did make it so that it affected the moon's colors there. On Tora I wanted to go a different route though. Since it has life, I wanted to explain any cool surface alterations through that avenue rather than use the radiation again. So I hope that answers your question. Anyways, that will do it for today's episode. If you made it all the way till the end, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave me a comment. I'd love to read your thoughts on today's episode, as it's the first time I really did something of the speculative biology kind on this channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Join me again next episode as we will move on to Manta's third moon. We already spent two episodes on Tora, and this is Project Espa, not Project Tora after all, so it's about time we built some more worlds. Look forward to it, and I hope to see you again in that next video. Bye!